it's the kind of situation when you get involved in this kind of program, you don't want to leave it. And you knew when you came to Carmichael that if you weren't even up for the game a little bit, once you got on the floor and they started playing the theme song and the fight song and people started standing up and cheering and, you know, you just get goosebumps. I'm sitting right here now and I got goosebumps just thinking about it. Carmichael, it will, it'll never die because uh, too much went on there and, and you just, the whole, the Carolina program known today was built in Carmichael and that will never be forgotten. Forgotten. Hello everybody, I'm John Kilgo, and I'm standing in front of Carmichael Auditorium. For 20 years, this was the basketball home of the North Carolina Tar Heels, but maybe we shouldn't call it a home because it was more like a palace. North Carolina invited the very best college basketball teams in America to this building, and 90% of the time when the final horn sounded, North Carolina walked away victorious. Now when you have success like this and domination like this, you give birth to folklore, to mythology, and yes, even to some exaggeration. But let's make one thing clear at the very start of this program. Every North Carolina player that played in this building, every Carolina team that performed here, contributed in a very meaningful way to the tradition that is North Carolina basketball. Now, did we leave out some big individual plays? Yes. Did we leave out some important games? The answer to that also is yes. We had to because time is a factor here. But let's not dwell on what isn't here, let's dwell instead on what is. Because the thrills, the wins, the magic, many and very, no question about it. So now, if you will, let's go inside together and relive some of those Carmichael classics. Uh, this place is filled with special memories. There's no doubt about that. Some of it, but not all of it, is captured on the banners that hang overhead. They record the fact that Carolina basketball was outstanding before Carmichael ever opened its doors. But any historian would have to concede that the most glorious era of a great past took place in this building. In the last 19 years, Carolina never finished lower than second in the ACC. Tar Heel teams out of this building won 13 regular season ACC championships, nine Atlantic Coast Conference tournament titles, took seven trips to the NCAA Final Four, and had an unbelievable Carmichael record of 164 wins and only 20 losses. Also something else unique, the Carolina basketball teams that played here, all 20 of them were coached by the same man, Dean Smith. His work has been widely imitated and certainly acclaimed all over the world, including a seat in basketball's Hall of Fame. So let's begin this odyssey of Carmichael Auditorium with the man most responsible for making it happen, Coach Dean Smith. Coach, how are you? Fine, John. I, I didn't make anything happen. They just told me I was coaching here and starting Carmichael. You made an awful lot of things happen. What did this build? You coached four years in Woolen, didn't you, Coach? I think it was four years. It seemed like a lifetime over there because we weren't winning quite as many games. What did Carmichael mean to you at that point in building your program at Carolina? I think it was essential for our uh, program to have a place other than Woolen Gym. You know, Wake was playing in Memorial Gym up at Winston. It seated maybe 8,500. Duke had indoor stadium. State had 12,400. And right here in the Big Four, it was very important that we have an arena that seated more than 4,000 in bleacher seats. And of course, I was excited when Chancellor Aycock uh, said there's a chance to have an addition to Woolen Gym. Now, you will notice, maybe, John, that the, the original plans had those bleachers to go back into Woolen, and they're going to knock that wall out. But it was going to cost too much, so they said, just leave the wall there. When you talk about, when you recall that, Dean, wasn't there somewhere in there that if you, uh, that we can give you this now, with this many seats, if you can wait, maybe you'll get fourteen or 15,000 seats? Chancellor Aycock said, roughly, uh, of course, he didn't really leave the decision up to me, but he said, what would you prefer a place that 
could we could see maybe 8,000, 8,500 addition to Woolen Gym or a new Coliseum, maybe seeing 14,000 down the road in about six years. And of course, I didn't know whether I'd be coaching that long. <laughs> we didn't get a place to recruit to. And so Carmichael was uh, really needed for our basketball program. And we sold it on the idea for commencement, which has been used for commencement, and some place bigger than Memorial Hall where we could entertain, uh, you know, have entertainers in. And the entertainment on December 4, 1965, was basketball. The first tap in Carmichael, controlled by William and Mary. But the first basket will belong to the Tar Heels, two great players on this Carolina team, Larry Miller to Bob Lewis underneath, and the Carmichael school board lights up for the first time. Larry Miller, who was to get 22 points in his Carmichael debut, shows that he can do it from the outside. And guard Ray Hassel will get a good pass from center Bob Bennett for the open jumper and a Carolina basket. Larry Miller, though only 6'4", was a fierce rebounder. Watch him underneath, keeps fighting for it before he taps it in. 16 rebounds in this game for Miller. Time running out in the first half, John Yokely with the jumper. North Carolina, the first half at Carmichael, 39, William & Mary, 29. Dean Smith's budget in those days called for black and white film in the second half. Watch this unselfish pass from Tommy Gauntlet to Bobby Lewis for two of his 34 points. Dean Smith recalls the good defense in this game, Merkin with the block, which will end with another good pass to Miller for a layup. And then Miller will show himself the complete player with this steal and the layup as the Tar Heels win 82-68, and the Carmichael era is underway. What did it do, Coach, for your recruiting, that initial impact after you moved in here? Well, you never know for sure. I don't think anyone chose to come here because of this building. Right. I do remember standing outside right over there and this big hole here to Rusty Clark's mother and Rusty and, and saying, uh, you know, I hope you'll be sitting here watching your son play. So, And uh, Larry Miller, when he came, I know... Uh, this picture was uh, presented outside of Carmichael Auditorium, the big hole in the ground. So you never know whether that was a factor, but it certainly should help. Do you recall uh, a picture that we've seen that you and Coach Smith and Assistant Coach Kenny Roseman at that time were standing outside, kind of looking at a hole in the ground? I remember it quite well. And it, it was that the, it was, that's where Carmichael was that's going, right? right? They, they, they were building at that time, and I, all I could think about was, why is it taking so long? Larry, in your Carolina career, was there any game or a couple of games that stand out in your career as special games that you'll never forget? Well, yes, probably the last game, because it was my, the last time here, it stood out very well in my mind. Because it's the kind of situation, when you get involved in this kind of program, you don't want to leave it. And uh, for me, it was very emotional, the last game because I was standing out there by myself, ready to cry. Right. And all these people are standing and giving me a standing ovation. And then uh, I just wanted them to stop, you know, so I could wipe away the tears. Coach, back in the days when you recruited Larry Miller, you know, that was, a lot of people thought that that was the guy that you brought in. You'd say, OK, that's the, the I know you had Bobby Lewis the year before, but Larry Miller was the, was the kind of a key player. Do you well, Larry that? was the first one that Duke wanted that we had got. Uh, Bobby, they weren't sure he could play uh, guard or he'd have to play inside. Uh, so they weren't sure whether they wanted Bobby Lewis, but they certainly wanted Larry Miller. And in fact, Larry kept going so long, they'd already signed eight players before Larry. And Larry said, I want some playing time on a freshman and end up coming with us. And uh, so that was a big breakthrough. To me, an even greater breakthrough was to finally have a big man in Rusty Clark because you can have five Larry Millers and you'd be competing like mad and you'd win a lot of games, let me say that, but you would also need to have some size in there and Rusty and Bill Bunning in that class of 69 was really the turning point in getting some size. And that, that Grubar and Tuttle and uh, Joe oh. Brown, that group. Dick Grubar uh, was part of the group with Rusty Clark, Bill Bunning, and Dick Grubar, those three started for three years on those great teams. Uh, Dick Grubar, a high school postman, 
He was a point guard, a very heady, smart point guard, and meant a lot to our team. But then the other two, Joe Brown and Gerald Tuttle, won a lot of games for us without ever starting a lot of times. They did start, but not a lot of times. But it was a great nucleus class. And that, and that 69 team, Coach, well, that was a group bar and that class, senior class, that had done so much for th three straight trips to the Final Four. That's all they did. Hey, you know, not only that, to win three regular season ACC, and that means you're, now here you go, you have to win again to even go to the national tournament. That's pressure. Isn't That's it? pressure. People talk about big ones. Those were big ones. Every one of those three in the tournament. And th that group, uh, 67, 68, and 69 team, won not only the regular season outright, but the tournaments. And I think that's an amazing feat. I think we had uh, all the spectrum of the players. We had the, the, the point guard, the, the, big, the big guard, the small forward, the big forward, and the center. And I think uh, we were the first group that he recruited that way, and he brought five of us in, though three of us ended up only starting, you know, for three years. The other two, Gerald Tuttle and Joe Brown, played a, a key role in, in, the, in the success that we had. So I think we came together as, as one group, and I think it helped us through. Dick, what is the special and unique relationship between player and coach under Coach Dean Smith at Carolina? Well, I, I just think we think back and uh, trying to recall, you know, what it was. It was just uh, the respect that you had for the man. Um, the knowledge that he put into the game and, and the preparation that he, he had you ready. I mean, there was never, even our first year as sophomores, nothing came up in a game time situation that we hadn't seen before. And I think his preparation was unbelievable and the uh, understanding of the game was just immense. And then I think he had some, he's had good players. And uh, we were, you know, fortunate along the way to win some close ones. Dick, your team was really the first one to play in Carmichael because as a freshman, the freshman team preceded the varsity against William and Mary uh, in this building. What was so special for a Carolina basketball player about playing in Carmichael? I think it's just the fans. I mean, the, the fan support that you had, uh, you knew when you came to Carmichael that if you weren't even up for the game a little bit, once you got on the floor and they started playing the theme song and the fight song and people started standing up and cheering and, you know, you just get goosebumps. I'm sitting right here now and I got goosebumps just thinking about it. Dick playing in Carmichael for three Atlantic Coast Conference championship teams, regular season and tournament championship teams. Was there one game here in Carmichael that stood out in your mind as special on a birth of the I don't really think we had, I had a special game. I, I, I tried to think back driving over here today, and um, I just think that my four years here just kind of just all blends together as you know, four of the greatest years of my life. When you talk about Carmichael Classics, Coach, I guess you could sit here and say hey, Charlie Scott was involved in an awful lot of classics every time he played. He surely was, and then we talk about key members to keep the Carolina basketball pro program going or even moving it up a notch. You have to talk about Charles Scott because, number one, he was a great player. Number two, he was an excellent student. But number three, he was the first recruited, not the first recruited, the first black player on scholarship uh, beneath Maryland in the whole United States. And uh, from that sense to what has accomplished, he was a leader there and certainly we had tried prior to Charles Scott to get any number of black student athletes in, uh, on scholarship to the University of North Carolina. We had Willie Cooper on the freshman team. But uh, Charles has that significance, I think, to the entire ACC. Uh, Maryland did have two black players prior to Charles, but then Charles was the next. And then Charles helped bring Ricky Lanier here in football uh, right. the following year. So, uh, Charles uh, has a special place in North Carolina basketball in addition to all his outstanding play. It wasn't always easy for Charles at that, at that time either. He, I thought he handled himself like a champion every time he went places. I think he did, uh, and I think he, he was such a competitor, and anybody said anything to him, he was even better. And uh, I think he did so much defensively. He worked hard. He improved defensively. He improved his judgment. He was a little out of control uh, as a freshman. In that, those days, you know, uh, freshmen weren't eligible to play, and I think it was very important for him to go through that experience and learn to play under control. So we may, uh, I'll salute Charles Scott along with you on this program. Scott's last Carmichael game also saluted by his family and friends. And they see Charlie get off to the quick start with this jumper against Virginia Tech. And then senior Eddie Fogler, now a Carolina assistant coach, gives Scott a beautiful backdoor pass for another two points. Charlie Scott always had a flair for the dramatics. He beats the halftime buzzer with this jumper as the Tar Heels led by 25. And watch him attack the Virginia Tech zone. Wide open, another two. Scott was also a superb rebounder. He had 13 in this game. 
triggers the fast break, but he won't stop there. Watch him get the wing position and another jumper. Virginia Tech should know, never take your eye off Charlie Scott. He gets the pass back on the inbounds play for the layup. Scott went out to a six minute standing ovation, but coach Dean Smith put him in for a curtain call and Scott hits another jumper. He said goodbye to Carmichael with 38 points, 13 rebounds, and five assists. The, the next year you lost Charlie Scott. If, I, if memory serves correctly, you will pick fifth or sixth in the Atlantic Coast Conference. South Carolina had that great team with every, everybody back, and what we, we're getting ready to see in the program now is when South Carolina came into Carmichael in 71, ranked second in the nation, and your basketball, that was such a tough, gutsy basketball team at Carolina had that. It really was, and uh, they went on to distinguish themselves as regular season champion, which I think we were picked by most riders, sixth or seventh, which shows you don't always go by prediction, but I was worried that year. Uh, we had Lee Deadman for experience, we uh, some uh, Wysig Previs and uh, Chamberlain to be, uh, they were juniors that didn't play a lot as sophomores, and then uh, George Carl came in as a sophomore, and it was a tremendous team. In that year, South Carolina, with his talent coaching the game we're about to see, if, if, if I'm right, they kind of like to, Frank McGuire like to play a, a lot of zone with that team. Oh, okay. yeah. You spread the court and say, let's play man-to-man -to -man tonight. That well, they were the playing 6'10", 6'9", 6'9", front line, and against our smaller people, and we didn't think they could keep up with us, and uh, it worked out that time. Well, Coach, it did work out, and the crowd loved it as the Tar Heels pulled the taller Gamecocks out of the zone, opening up the lane for George Carl for Carolina's first basket. This was a very physical basketball game. John Roach takes it to the basket, hits the floor, and before this one's over, he's stepped on by three players. The Gamecocks don't get back on defense, and George Carl takes advantage with a drive down the middle. Great defensive play by Steve Previs against John Roach. He hounded him into five of 15 shooting. And the Tar Heels once again get off on a fast break. This basket won't be successful, but watch the Tar Heels battle the Gamecocks on the boards until Bill Chamberlain finally taps it in. Two juniors team up here, Dennis Wysick to Steve Previs, a layup. Carolina leads it 40-26 at halftime. And then controversy the second half. John Roach throws the basketball at official Jim Hernjack and gets a technical foul. Coach Frank McGuire argues at the scorer's table to try to overrule it, but does not do any good. And some nights, you just don't want your photograph taken. But all of McGuire's antics don't pay off. The Tar Heels are primed for victory. Watch the hustle by George Carl as he gets this long tap, takes it back to the basket for two of his 17 points, and North Carolina goes on here to knock off the second-ranked Gamecock 79-64, giving South Carolina its first loss of the season, and the Tar Heels served a message to the rest of the ACC that, again, they would contend for the title. So North Carolina got the great victory over South Carolina. At, you know, you and Frank McGuire have been friends and still are. For, for so long, that had to be a great win for you against the Gamecocks. It was. It was early in the conference season, and that was important. And then, uh, of course, we went on and won the regular season. Uh, still, you go ahead to that 72 is really a, a year that, that we had four returning starters, but yet uh, at that point we had Lee Dedman graduating, Dave Chavik, who helped us win the NIT in 71 when Dennis Wysick tore up his knee. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, a great place for Bob McAdoo to fit in, and he was here one year and certainly produced in that one year, as did the entire 72 team. That was a, that was a great North Carolina team, wasn't it, Coach? I think it was. Uh, I thought we were, we lost by one point like three or four times, so you can imagine what kind of team it would have been. Uh, we beat South Carolina easily in the NCAA. Mm -hmm. We won the regular season and the tournament, and then went on and beat South Carolina uh, easily because maybe that 71 in the NCAA beat Penn, went to the Final Four, and <clears throat> played a Florida State team that was playing out of their mind. Uh, I think we were looking a little ahead to UCLA. We were ranked two in the country. UCLA was ranked one. But that would have been fun to see a matchup of one and two that year. Well, the North Carolina basketball team in 72, it was 9-0 and oh in Carmichael. In 73, it was 6-3 and three in Carmichael. And that coach takes us to 1974 in a game that, I, that at least 100,000 people had to sit in this building to see. North Carolina versus Duke with uh, 
they were ahead eight points with 17 seconds left. Well, the hard part is the fact they were up. Uh, Duke was not a great team that year, and we were a much better team, I thought, and we'd already won at Duke in a close one, but I do think they're playing for their coach. Uh, he was on a one-year kind of contract, and their team just played extremely well up until this point. At that point, though, Coach, with eight down, 17 seconds left, in your heart, did you think if there was a chance to win? I honestly, maybe it's nutty on my part, but I think we always have a chance up to a point being realistic. And we knew at that time out that Bobby had two foul shots. He said, now we'll take it down to six. Let's really put our 24 defense on him. Don't let it get it in bounds. And we knew we had our timeouts left, but I knew it would be very difficult. So uh, I thought we'd make a good run, but I'm not maybe dreaming we would tie it in 17 seconds. Well, in the highlights, we're getting ready to see in a, in a second, Coach. There was a point that North Carolina said, hey, we're going to win the game. You could, you could almost see it when you got it to four that the players, the way they went to the bench, said, we're going to win. Well, and the problem with Duke bench felt, hey, they might win this. <laughs> and, and that helped Kramer, who was a great foul shooter. We had to foul him, uh, help him miss, because I'm sure they were already celebrating a great victory for them. What has that game meant to you, the comeback, uh, when you can talk to basketball players at North Carolina? Hey, don't ever give up. That had to mean so much. I think so. I don't know. Uh, because when you're experiencing it yourself, uh, that's more important. Uh, we went from nine down in Wake Forest in the ACC tournament in 75. Yep. I might have mentioned 74 at that time, but I think the longer we get away from it, uh, we probably don't go back. And can't you see me in 1990 saying, hey, back in 74, <laughs> we came from behind. No, I don't think we'll go back and use it that long, but it's a, it's a fun thing to see again. But at the time, it wasn't fun to Carolina fans. Duke led by eight with only 22 seconds left. The comeback starts innocently enough. John Custer will miss a jumper from the corner, but Duke's Bob Fleischer fouls Bobby Jones underneath. Jones hits two foul shots to cut the lead to six. Fleischer throws it between the legs of Ed Stahl. Walter Davis gets it underneath the Custer. Duke leads by four, timeout Carolina. Duke tries to get it in again, but this time it goes off the leg of Tate Armstrong, Carolina ball. Walter Davis will trigger the inbounds play, shoots it off the baseline, it's no good. He's going to tap it once. Bobby Jones then puts it in. Duke leads by two with six seconds left. Now the Blue Devils will get it in on this sequence. Pete Kramer gets it in the corner and the Tar Heels foul immediately with four seconds left and the pressure is on. One foul shot by Kramer and Duke wins the game, but he misses and Ed Stahl rebounds for the Tar Heels. Three seconds left. Time for one more miracle. Kupchak, long pass to Davis. He'll take three dribbles, lets it go, banks it in, and we go to overtime as the Tar Heel comeback is complete. We had confidence that we could always come back, no matter, um, you know, we never did give up because things like that happen sometimes when you uh, don't give up. Uh, Coach Smith just designed that play right in the huddle. Um, Mitch ran along the baseline and threw the ball to me. And uh, I started on one side of the court, then went to the other. And I think they thought I was a decoy and they were going to throw it to Bobby Jones long. And I just happened to get in, had to go, and it went in for me. And watch Walter Davis. He's the last to react as his shot went in. And in overtime, most people forget, but the Tar Heels again trail by four. But Carolina wouldn't give in, and on plays like this by Walter Davis, who had a career-high 31, North Carolina went on to win, and the most incredible comeback in the history of college basketball is complete. This one may be remembered forever as the definitive Carmichael Classic. Most Carolina basketball fans can tell you where they were and what they were doing the day that Walter Davis hit that big shot to put the Carolina Duke game into overtime. This guy right here is Phil Ford. He was still a senior, Rocky Mount High School, when Walter made that shot. Phil, tell us, what were you doing when Walter made the shot heard around the basketball world? Well, at the time, Mr. Kilgore, I had gone outside to wash my dad's car, and uh, I came back in, and the game was still on. I didn't see it live, but I've seen many repeats of it. How in the world did you give up on Carolina so quick to go outside and wash your car? You thought well, they were dead, didn't you? Eight points, 17 seconds. That's, <laughs> that's kind of even kind of un unbelievable for Coach Smith, you know? You and Walter Davis are great personal friends, even to this day. What does Walter say? I know he must have told you a hundred times about that shot. Well, he won't say it's luck, but I think <laughs> it was a lot of luck involved in that shot, Mr. Kilgore. Somebody told me that, uh, and you know that if, if, if this is true or not, somebody told me that Coach Smith gave him the ball 
the next day in practice and walked to let's see you do it again. He missed it by block. He did. He did. That's <laughs> a true story. You know, when you came to Carolina the following year, it was in the David Thompson era at NC State. Uh, they had beaten North Carolina, uh, I think, uh, eight straight times with Thompson, nine straight times overall, uh, two times in your freshman year in the yes, Big sir. Four tournament in Greensboro and over in Raleigh. Yes, sir. And you got them in this building for the first time in 1975. And that game had to be a tremendously pressure game. Carolina had to be feeding. We've got to beat these guys somewhere. It really was. Um, uh, I think I think Mickey Bell had never beaten David Thompson, and they were seniors at the same time. And uh, we were really excited about that game. And uh, as I said before, we got him over here, and uh, it was a big win for us. But things didn't look good early for Carolina. David Thompson on this follow shot was going to get 32 points on the evening. But North Carolina at the other end, Lagarde to Cupchak for the layup as the Tar Heels battle back. Now watch Brad Hoffman. He'll make the good steal here, give it to Phil Ford. Ford is going to take it in against Monty Tao, and Ford had 19 points in the first half. More of the same in the second half as Walter Davis gets the rebound. Goes to Hoffman, to Ford, and he's going to shoot the jumper over Mo Rivers to get the Tar Heels off to a good start. But State hit their first three jumpers in the second half. This one by Kenny Carr to get right back in the basketball game. And then Phil Ford picks up his fourth foul with 17 minutes left, and Dean Smith calls for the four corners. With Ford on the bench, John Kuster takes over and banks in this short jumper. And then Kuster again, going to run out of the four corners, and he'll find Mitch Kupchak at the end of this play for another Tar Heel basket as Carolina led by 11 with seven minutes left. But State wouldn't die. This steal, pass ahead to David Thompson, for the layup. And then Mo Rivers is going to come right back for State and pick Phil Ford's pocket to take it in for another layup. The news continued bad for the Tar Heels. 420 left. Ford takes it to the basket. Call for charging. He's out of the ball game and he's going to leave the Carmichael court with tears in his eyes as Mickey Bell consoles him. Monty Tao, the little State guard, hits from way outside as State comes within one. But the Tar Heels hit three foul shots down the stretch and seal the victory over rival North Carolina State. And on this evening, the string did stop and set the stage for a Carmichael celebration that would last well into the night. That was obviously a critical win for North Carolina, very important. And what made it even better, Phil, you went on to beat them for the championship game of the Atlantic Coast Conference Tournament. Yes, sir, that was a real big win for us, and uh, David had a tremendous game, and uh, we were just lucky that Mitchell played very well that game, and Walter, and uh, we got him again. You know, then you go back the next, this, the following year, 1976, Mitch Kupchak, Walter Davis, that group. You think that's one of the best teams you ever played on? I think, uh, talent-wise, that was probably the best team and the best year when I was here. Yeah, I think that that sophomore, when I was a sophomore, I think that uh, we really had a great squad that year. Eight and one in Carmichael, 25 and four overall. Unfortunately, you go to Rocky Mount after <laughs> after the season, and what you you got hurt playing yeah. pickup basketball. I hurt my knee. You know, it's a funny story to that. Uh, I went home and uh, I was in a pickup basketball game, and I come back and I have to walk in Coach Smith's office, and I'm kind of nervous and I walk in his office and uh, I tell him I went home, played, got hurt and uh, hurt my knee. He wasn't upset. Next year, uh, just before we were out in Portland, Oregon in the Far West Classic, I go home to Rocky Mountain, don't go near basketball. Come back, he asked me did I play, he was upset. <laughs> <laughs> Our next Carmichael Classic also upset a lot of people, not because Carolina lost, but because it was the last home game for five seniors, including Walter Davis. I guess uh, NC State was, uh, I think, the, our biggest rivalry. Uh, while I was there in school, um, we always wanted to beat them. And, um, you know, I just never, I hated losing to, to anybody, but to them mostly. And we just wanted to win that game really bad. And it was my last game there in Carmichael. And uh, everybody wants to go out winning that last game. 
you kind of try to think of as um, as another game. Uh, <clears throat> he wanted to go on and on uh, playing for uh, Carolina. Uh, you never wanted to end because that was the best four years of my life. Uh, <clears throat> I try not to think about this being my last game and just think about NC State. And it was awful tough. And But when it got down to it, uh, the main thing was just to win. And that's just what the Tar Heels did. Watch the ball movement. The jumper by senior John Kuster. State was led in scoring by Kenny Carr with 18. Here he helps keep State in it. With the basket and the foul, State leads by one. But Carolina takes the lead for good on this play by Tom Zalagaris, who hit all five of his shots. This Carolina team went on to finish second in the NCAAs, and a great freshman class was a big help. Here, freshman Rich Yonaker hits the lefty hook. And Michael Corrin, the freshman from Jersey City, New Jersey, always gave the Tar Heels an emotional lift. You think he's not excited? Just watch it. His 14 points helped Carolina to a 12-point halftime lead. And in the second half, this all Carolina. Ford on the fast break to Davis. It rattles around and falls. You'll see the same combination again. One of Ford's school record 14 assists, another basket for Davis. Here, the fast break started by senior Bruce Buckley. He gets it to Ford, to Davis. He penetrates, gets it to O'Corin for another Tar Heel 2. We told you about Ford's big assist day, also a big scoring day, 24 points for Ford, who would have his own big senior day the following year. It's always fun to go out with a bang, and Walter Davis does. His last Carmichael basket, an exciting fast break layup, and the Tar Heels finish off a big route of state, 90 to 73. The win completed, the seniors go out to a big ovation, celebrating their four years at Carolina and another Carmichael Classic. 77, arguably as good a team as Carolina ever had. You and Walter Davis, Michael Corn was a, uh, a freshman player, uh, John Kuster, but the injury is devastating. Yes, Walter um, um, at the time had a broken finger. Tom Lagarde wasn't with us on the, on the team. Uh, at that time he had an operation on his knee. I had a hyperextended elbow, but uh, we didn't make it to the finals. Just couldn't put it out. Went to the finals against Marquette after beating Purdue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Notre Dame on St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. Kentucky yeah. when you couldn't play the second half. Right. And, right. and Las Vegas, which might have been, been as good in, as yeah. anybody that year. Yeah, and uh, we lost to Marquette out of all those teams. Yeah. And then it seemed like uh, Phil Ford just, we, we couldn't, when we get a guy like Phil Ford say, this guy will never be a senior. He enjoys the game too much. He's got that little boy in him that he uh, wants to play basketball forever. But that senior year came against Duke. Walter Davis a year before had gone out. Kuster had gone out very emotional. I remember Phil Ford saying, I will not cry on my last day. <laughs> That's true. Walter and I had a bet, you know, and uh, he bet me that I would cry, and I said I wouldn't. But I think I wouldn't have cried if the guys hadn't come out and just started clapping for me uh, at midcourt Zell and Jeff Crump and myself. That was really emotional. Phil loses his bet to Walter Davis that day because the tears did flow, as they did also for senior Tom Zalagaris. This game was for the regular season Atlantic Coast Conference Championship. And as you watch it and remember it, you'll no doubt agree it was a storybook game for Phil Ford. Here, out of the corner, his jump shot. But Duke would finish second in the nation this year. They had three players in this game with 20 points or more. And here, Gene Banks gets two of his 25. Duke had a 10-point lead in the first half before Carolina put on the good defense. They force a missed shot. The outlet pass goes to Ford, and he's quickly underway. Watch him steal the ball now from Jeminski, and out of the lane, put this one back up and in. Carolina knocks the ball loose. Zalagaris on the floor, scoops it to Wolf, who gives it to Phil Ford. He races into the forecourt for Carolina. Duke leaves him open and pays the price for it. And then right before the first half is over, Ford with an interception, quickly the other way. Hits Dudley Bradley, he misses, but freshman Al Wood is there to tap it in for two of his 19, and Carolina cuts the Duke lead to one at halftime. And then in the second half, Carolina's outstanding defensive player, Dudley Bradley, comes up with a steal and triggers a fast break to Ford once more. How many times have we seen that jump shot in this game? Ford now moves to his left, pulls up, and this jumper cuts the Duke lead to two. 
The Blue Devils hurry things just a little bit. Pass intercepted by Wolf, who gets it to Ford. Once again, his shot cuts a five-point Duke lead to three. Duke again leads by five as Ford puts it high off the glass and in. He's foul, makes the foul shot, and cuts the Duke lead to two. And then watch the great defensive play by Jeff Wolf. He blocks a shot of Kenny Denard, forces another bad shot, and then gets the rebound and throws ahead to Phil Ford, who's going to pitch it to Michael Corrin for the duck. We're tied at 58 with 11 minutes left. Carolina builds an eight-point lead. Ford to Wolf out of the four corners. That gives Carolina a 10-point lead. But it was Duke's turn to come back, a chance to tie right here. And the Blue Devils will get an excellent shot. Bobby Bender underneath, but he misses. The Tar Heels rebound. Wolf to Ford again, and look for O'Corn at the other end of this break for the dunk, and the Tar Heels lead by four. But Duke cuts it to one. Michael Corn is fouled with 12 seconds left, and he'll go to the foul line to give Carolina a two-point lead. His second shot misses, is tapped out, Ford gets it, and Duke fouls him with six seconds left. So Ford goes to the foul line now. The Tar Heels protecting a two-point lead. He rattles this one in and then celebrates along with the crowd in Carmichael Auditorium. His second shot is good. The Tar Heels go on to beat Duke. The fans thank Phil Ford as he races off the Carmichael court with 34 points, his third straight ACC regular season championship, and the Carmichael crowd stays around to shout his name. Coach, any time Phil Ford played, it was an experience for Carolina fans because he was, in, in, I think, in every sense of the word, a very special kind of basketball player. I know he gave me confidence. Uh, I, I remember saying to the Olympic Selection Committee in 76, I said, I know Ford hadn't played well, but really we've got to find a new coach if he's not on this team because I felt that confident with Phil in control of the ball. He somehow exudes confidence to the others and I once told him, I said, you give me so much confidence. He said, I gave him confidence. I said, wait a minute, you give me first. That was some performance this last game at Carmichael. It really was because it was meaningful too. It was for the regular season championship and win over Duke and I never think there would be such pressure on a young man going to that foul line in his last home game uh, here against Duke for the championship and sure enough he always comes through and he did it well. And then uh, of course after 78, 79 comes in with a team that all of a sudden were losing Phil Ford, but we had a really a good group of players that ended up very high in the national rank. And I think those, that's one of those years where they exceeded uh, even our coaching staff expectations. Well, Coach, looking at that 1979 season, we're reminded of the tough competition your teams faced. Here in December 1978, you beat eventual national champion Michigan State and their great player Magic Johnson. And in December 1980, Indiana and star Isaiah Thomas lost to the Tar Heels in Carmichael. I remember Johnson throwing the ball away about nine times and had about 10 assists, but Dudley Bradley did a great job on Magic and our press bothered Isaiah some, but that helped Indiana in 81 in the finals. The fact that they'd been here and lost, I think made them mad and they were better uh, in the finals because of having lost here in Carmichael. But I think one player that Dean really wanted to play about 36 games in Carmichael ended up playing only four here. Ralph Sampson, the great player <laughs> from Virginia that uh, had great games, just uh, almost storybook games. Well, I don't say his freshman year. He went, then he wanted to be a forward and he was playing it. Jeff Wolf drove past him. And he was a great player, but they were struggling at that time, uh, when he, late in his freshman year. We had some great battles with Sampson. I think you told me we won more times than we lost to him. Six would, out of ten, which is... Six out of ten. I'd settle for uh, five of ten or four out of ten maybe when he signed with Virginia. One of the best of the ten was in 1982 when the top-ranked Tar Heels hosted the second-ranked Cavaliers. James Worthy will grab this missed shot and put it back to give a message to the men in orange that this one would be a war. Ricky Stokes... A beautiful bounce pass to Sampson, who knows how to intimidate, and the Cavaliers led by four at halftime. In the second half, Jimmy Black on the back door to freshman Michael Jordan for the dunk. 
that Jeff Jones of Virginia will throw a beautiful alley-oop pass to Sampson, who dunks it over James Worthy. The Cavaliers led by nine with nine minutes left. But watch the work of Matt Doherty on defense. He deflects the ball away from Jeff Jones, gets a pass from Jordan, and lays it in. And Doherty keeps right on hustling. He'll deflect this ball off the hands of Othell Wilson, and the Tar Heels believe they can do it. Michael Jordan brings Samson to him, hits Sam Perkins for the wide open jumper, and the Tar Heels take the lead. Jimmy Black fouled out, and Jimmy Braddock hit four big free throws down the stretch to keep North Carolina on top. But the Cavaliers weren't dead. They had this last chance. Sampson's shot won't go. The tap won't. Virginia knocks it out of bounds, and the victory belongs to Carolina. The Tar Heels celebrate that win that preserved their rank as the best in college basketball. But later that year came the ultimate and final challenge. The Tar Heels had to beat Georgetown and Patrick Ewing to stay number one. And in a classic title game, it took a Michael Jordan jumper with 17 seconds left to give Carolina a one-point win and the NCAA championship. Coach, about a week after the Georgetown game, I was sitting right over there interviewing Michael for a newspaper column. And I asked him, I said, that shot, the last shot that you made against Georgetown, were you nervous? And he said, I really wasn't nervous when I took it. He said, but now after being around all this and seeing what people are seeing, I probably couldn't hit the backboard with the you ball. You know, ironically, if he'd missed, Sam Perkins had, and there's another great player at, oh. Car at Carmichael and Carolina. Sam had the whole board to himself. The three guys went to box out, box out James. And so if he missed long, Sam would have been the hero, uh, maybe, because he would have made it, and they'd had less time to come down and score. Well, it was uh, your, one of the impressive things or the, the heartwarming things that you remember, the way the players, whether you liked it or not, the way the players wanted to win that for you so you wouldn't hear that junk again about the big well, game. Jimmy Black and James Worthy, uh, Matt Doherty, uh, in fact, the entire team. Uh, you know, it was a special team and it will always will be in Carolina history. The next year was a historic one for the ACC. You do remember the 30-second shot clock and the three-point field goal. Adrian Branch banks one off the glass as Carolina coach Dean Smith smiles in disbelief. Matt Doherty comes back in the second half to hit his own three-pointer for the Tar Heels. And then after this Maryland miss by Branch, Jimmy Braddock is gonna take it all the way down the lane for two more Carolina points. Matt Doherty, a good pass inside to Michael Jordan and a superb move to the basket, but even so, Carolina trail by two with less than 20 seconds left to play. Mike Patrick called it this way. Jordan to Braddock, 15 seconds left. Braddock, three-pointer, good! Jimmy Braddock, a three-pointer! Cow, what a shot! Listen to that crowd! But Maryland still had a chance to win. Keep your eye on Michael Jordan at the top of the key. He goes all the way underneath the basket to reject that shot by Chuck Drizell of Maryland. The ball out of bounds, time runs out, and the Tar Heels had repelled Maryland's tough challenge. Just four weeks later, another classic ACC game in Carmichael. The Virginia Cavaliers come calling and Ralph Sampson played this one with a vengeance. Watch this dunk off a rebound right in the Tar Heels face. Sampson's dunk gives Virginia a 16 point lead with 9.45 left. Then Matt Doherty hits out of the corner to give Carolina some hope comes from Coach Smith. Um, we're in a situation, uh, we're down 14, he calls timeout, and he, says, he smiles and says, uh, wouldn't it be fun to pull this out and win it? The fun begins with a Jordan Bank shot off the glass, Virginia by 12. And then Jimmy Braddock with a three-pointer, that comes with 4-12 left and cuts the Virginia lead to seven. Braddock's defense now will force an Othell Wilson turnover as Virginia coach Terry Holland says, I've seen this one somewhere before. 
Four foul shots cut the Virginia lead to three with 1.10 left. Braddock launched this three-pointer no good, but look at Michael Jordan with the tap in. Virginia by one. And then Rick Carlisle commits the cardinal sin. He forgets where Michael Jordan is. Jordan strips him of the ball, takes it into the lane, gives the Tar Heels a one-point lead. Uh, just going wild, wow. you know, uh, coach was giving me freelance and I was leaving my man and double teaming the ball everywhere it went. And uh, I went over to double team Carlisle and uh, he went past me and he forgot that I was behind him and I just snuck up from behind him and I stole it. And uh, coach uh, didn't like, I, I wouldn't say didn't like, but he was kind of, uh, he was nervous whenever I went up for, to dunk the ball because I went uh, from a distance. and. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm used to doing that, and I felt really comfortable doing it. But the Cavaliers weren't dead. With 10 seconds left, Rick Carlisle gets a wide-open jumper. He misses, and look at Michael Jordan soar over Sampson for the rebound. We're going to look at this one again from ground level. The shot misses. Jordan up for the rebound, and the Tar Heels hold off the Cavaliers one more time. Sam Perkins celebrates with an old friend by the name of James Worthy as the Tar Heels beat Ralph Sampson's Cavs for the sixth time in 10 tries. Coach, we talk about great comebacks, such as North Carolina coming back against Duke. What we just saw, North Carolina coming back against Virginia was unbelievable almost. It really was because the caliber of the competition and uh, Matt Doherty started that surge and you saw what Michael did there at the end, but Sam Perkins always somehow played well against Ralph Sampson, Virginia. And then the next year, one of the great basketball teams in all of college basketball history. We're not just talking Carmichael, but all of college basketball history. That team coach was just magnificent. I think you would agree that that's one of the best college teams you've ever seen. Well, I think so. I don't want to, again, compare teams. Uh, we've had so many great ones. All It's all relative, but in 84, to play the schedule we did, if you go back and how many tough road games we had, non-conference games, yeah. And to dominate the way we dominated, like Syracuse, we had them 33 or something. And when we were shooting the open 15-footer well that year, when we were, we didn't always, most of the time, because we'd get that shot any time, we were great defensively. And uh, when we did those things, I think we were just a great, great basketball team. And then the injuries hit. Steve Hale stepped in for Kenny Smith and did a marvelous job. And then when Kenny came back, we never quite got the same chemistry. Uh, Brad Doherty had hurt his uh, wrist. Right. And uh, so even then, we, we were still a great team and took Indiana's best shot in at all to beat us. And uh, in fact, Bob Knight tells me now, it's the worst thing that happened to that team because then they expected so much the following year. And I said, well, it's the worst thing that happened to that team as far as I'm concerned, too. You were number one from the first week all the way to the last week of the of the regular season polls that year. Which is unreal. I, I think Kentucky was, we were tied in some one of the polls, or Kentucky was one, but we quickly got the number one position and kept it. And so we'll, they'll get a flag like the 23 team, I guess, you know, a mythical championship. Well, Coach, another great comeback, again against Duke, that team uh, struggling at the end of the game, finding itself behind. And then Matt Doherty, who had been an unsung player, but a very good player for you, makes the big play for you to put Duke in overtime. It was exciting, to, too, because they go out, and it's Michael Jordan's last home game, as it turned it out. And uh, to go 14-0 and 0 in this conference, as tough as it was in 84, was a remarkable feat. Emotions ran high on senior day 1984 at Carmichael Auditorium. Matt Doherty, the great Sam Perkins, and Cecil Exum gather at midcourt to show exactly how they feel about one another. The crowd was on his feet, and the emotions also ran high for young players like Brad Doherty with this dunk against the rival Blue Devils. But Duke wanted to spoil this party, and Mark Allery's three-point play with 22 seconds left gave Duke a two-point lead. And then Danny Mahar on the foul line, nine seconds left, Duke leading by two, but he misses. Sam Perkins rebounds and calls time with seven seconds left. The pressure is on. Matt Doherty takes the ball the length of the court, almost loses it, gets off the shot of the lifetime, one he'll never forget. I knew when we set up the play that Michael was going to be double teamed, because who wouldn't double team Michael? So I took the ball from Sam, uh, ran down the court with the intention of going by Danny Mahar for a layup. 
and uh, I bobbled the ball a little bit, and uh, I just picked it up and let it ride in the, in the nets, and I was just jumping up and down, and I uh, have goosebumps right now from it, and uh, uh, knowing my family and friends were here, and my last home game, I just couldn't lose that game, I couldn't lose that game. And as usual, the Tar Heels did not lose, but it took one more overtime on dunks like this by Sam Perkins, and on this alley-oop to Michael Jordan, who, as it turns out, was also playing his last game at Carmichael. A touching moment as the seniors leave that player-coach relationship that makes Carolina basketball special. And on this day, the hero, and it's written on his face, was Matt Doherty. Now it's on to 1985, the last year in Carmichael, and Maryland coach Leffy Drissell is on the verge of making his last trip here a happy one. Maryland by three, 22 seconds left. The Maryland looks like they get a breakthrough here at North Carolina. Big shot still. Gatlin they misses the front end of a one and one. 20 sure. seconds left. Carolina's still alive. Be Smith. Time out here. Got it. Kenny Smith gets the basket at 72 71. 16 seconds left. Still a lot of time. At the line, Adrian Branch, three out of five, front end of a one and one. Foul shooting tonight has been critical and not very good. Hey, and he missed, missed again. Carolina has a chance now to pull this off. 11 seconds left. Peterson double teamed in the corner. Popson from 16. And Curtis Hunter kept the Turtles there by intercepting this inbounds pass as the Tar Heels beat Maryland once again. Dean Smith and Lefty Drizell shake hands after the game. And as Lefty leaves Carmichael for the last time, maybe he was wondering why it was always so hot in there. Then just before the final game in Carmichael, we get the answer to the age-old mystery did Dean Smith really turn up the heat? I have no idea where the furnace is or what kind of heat we use. <laughs> Frank always said, and he, he said, you say something to the mass, it's amazing how many believe it. When Norm said, and Dean turns the heat up in there. I mean, there are people that really believe. I went over and found a thermostat. <laughs> or found some janitor. Make sure it's hot in there. But even if Smith never found the thermostat, Opponents usually found it very hot in Carmichael, especially Clemson, when the last game was played on February 23, 1985. To add to the emotion, it was also senior day. Carolina got off to a rather slow start, but here Warren Martin and Brad Darty battled for the rebound and watched Steve Hale push the ball up court. Darty's going to rebound his missed shot and put it back in to get the Tar Heels started. And then Steve Hale will find Curtis Hunter for a little shot out of the lane. Keep your eye on Curtis now and watch this defensive play. Draws the charge at the other end, a play that Dean Smith loved. And Curtis is not through, gets that rebound. Hale to senior Buzz Peterson. Joe Wolf says, let me in on the fun. There were plenty of good defensive players in Carmichael's era but few better than Steve Hale. This dunk gives Carolina a 12-point lead. Hale can do it all, way up for the rebound. Looks for the open Kenny Smith in the corner. Another Tar Heel two. Warren Martin with the great block. Steve Hale gathers in the ball, rushes to the front court to Curtis for the layup. Carolina by 20 with two minutes left in the half. The second half starts the same way with Buzz Peterson hitting out of the corner. Steve Hale will battle for another rebound, gets it, finds his partner Kenny Smith for the dunk. Curtis Hunter with a big game on Carmichael's last day makes the steal, gives it to Buzz Peterson who dishes to Hale another Carolina layup. Junior Brad Darty had 16 rebounds in this game. Pulls down another one there and watch the ball movement on this particular offensive sequence. The break's not there. 
so Carolina moves the ball around. Martin finally gets the basket. Carolina by 39 right there. Now history in the making. Carolina's last basket in Carmichael by 22, Buzz Peterson. The first Carolina basket in Carmichael by 22, Bobby Lewis. What a familiar sight. A winning Dean Smith consoling a losing coach. And then he leaves Carmichael's court for what he thinks is the last time. But the fans didn't want this era to end. They stayed for a full 15 minutes begging for a curtain call. And uncharacteristically, Dean Smith came back to take a bow. It was, uh, I'm a sentimental, and I was feeling very much sentiment. Uh, uh, sadness in a way, uh, yet uh, we know progress, you move on, but this was a special time, and uh, I've had so many great times sitting there on the bench, and I uh, hope I can sit on the bench uh, the new place a few years.